If are in listen only mode. Hello, welcome everyone for joining. Uh, we're uh, just uh, waiting for folks to um, continue to log in here, so we'll be starting shortly. Let's see what just happened here. Greg, did you start the broadcast? Yes. So I'm still seeing a broadcast uh, dialog on my screen. Well, you can hit it, but it's gone. And I've got this over here, which won't go away. Let me stop showing. For a moment, folks, I'm going to rearrange the screens here. Hang on. If all went well, we should be where we need to be with um, the welcome screen. Back rearranged where it should be. Greg, give me a check here. Is that uh, what you're seeing on your end? Yes, you're good. Very good. Thanks. So, folks, thanks uh, for joining today. Um, you know, Additional folks will join as we as we move along here, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Lou Leinenweber. I'm the initiative director for this uh, OGC's Testbed 10. Uh, Luis Bermudez will be presenting on the cross-community interoperability thread. He is the thread architect. And Raj Singh will be presenting on the open mobility thread. Uh, he is also the thread architect for that uh, for that thread. For those on the um, attending uh, your audio. We um, recommend that you use voice over IP uh, audio if you're able to with uh, your computer speakers or a headset for best quality. Uh, for those if you are unable to use the voice over IP, you may dial in. Uh, the information about the telephone for US is shown on the screen here and uh, in your invite you also had a listing or a link to uh, listing of other phone numbers if you're in, in uh, other countries. So. That's how you can get the information about uh, the audio. But just a few words about um, housekeeping here as we get started. Um, first off, we encourage you as we go through the slides to ask questions using the uh, questions area in the webinar panel. Um, you're not limited to raising those questions at the end. You can do it as we go along, as you as the thought comes to mind. So please enter your questions as we go. And at the end, we will provide a time to answer as many of those questions as we can uh, at the end of the webinar. A copy of the slides and much of the information about the uh, testbed um, and the webinar will be available on the OGC Testbed 10 website at a link um, that will be provided later in the in this uh, slides and also on the um, in the press release and on the OGC uh, public website. Um, during the course of the slides, we'll be asking a few polls today. Uh, we'll uh, walk you through those as we get to them. Simple questions, um, just to get some basic demographics information. And today's webinar is being recorded, and all registrants will receive an email with instructions on how to view the recording on demand. It's also handy if you want to pass it along to any of your colleagues who may not have been able to attend. 
uh, we'll get that out to you, um, uh, information about the recording and how to access it as quickly as we can after we're finished today. It might be tomorrow before we get to the email out. Um, okay, so just a bit about uh, OGC uh, for those who may not be so familiar. Uh, the OGC is an international industry consortium of more than 475 companies, government agencies, and universities participating in a consensus process to develop publicly available standards. OGC standards support interoperable solutions that enable the web, wireless, and location-based services and mainstream IT. The standards uh, empower technology developers to make complex spatial information and services accessible and useful with all kinds of applications. Currently there are 38 implementation standards and hundreds of products on the market that implement these standards. In addition to its members, OGC maintains alliances with, and collaborative activities with ISO and numerous other standards organizations. OGC is organized into four programs areas as shown here. Uh, the standards program provides a well-established consensus process similar to other industry consortium such as uh, World Wide Web Consortium, OMA, and others. The compliance program provides mechanisms to allow organizations to test their implementations of OGC standards against mandatory elements of the standards. The communication and outreach program provides for education and training, encourages uptake of OGC specifications, supports business development and communications programs among and for the membership. Finally, the interoperability program is a global innovative hands-on rapid prototyping and testing program designed to unite users and industry in accelerating in interface development and validation and the delivery of interoperability to the market. These capabilities together support rapid development, standard setting, testing, and certification leading to market adoption. The interoperability program depends at its core on collaboration among leading technology users and providers to produce innovation through an agile development environment and processes. The process is accomplished through an effective model of shared cost to develop well-crafted standards and to provide solid foundations for future enterprise architectures and deployments. And last, the OGC interoperability program process has been proven and tested over many years to build and exercise private-public partnerships to drive trends in technology and interoperability. And just a few words about the OGC uh, Testbed 10 overall. It was, possible, it was made possible with requirements and funding resources provided by 11 different sponsors. Uh, 29 different organizations participated in this testbed to address the sponsor requirements. The total value of this testbed was $2.8 million U.S. 1.2 million uh, of that in funding provided by the sponsors combined with an additional 1.6 million dollars in value of in-kind contributions by the participants. The total value return on investment for this project then was approximately 2.3. Deliverables in the form of reports and software components are the tangible outcomes of this testbed. There are a total of 19 reports prepared as engineering reports, discussion papers, and change requests and 40 different software components were implemented as services or clients to demonstrate and test the new technologies developed in this testbed. Many thanks to all 11 sponsors who made this testbed possible. And you see the logos represented here for those sponsors. We much appreciate all their support uh, and contributions to make this possible. These are the 29 organizations that participated in the testbed to address the sponsor requirements. They're represented here by their logos. So there's many and they're spread across the, uh, across the globe. Uh, many international companies involved in US, Canada. Testbed 10 was organized into three major activity threads as shown. Now yesterday on the 27th of May, we conducted the webinar to present and demonstrate the outcomes from the aviation threads shown in the left-hand column. And today, we'll present the outcomes from the cross-community interoperability and open mobility threads summarized in the right two columns.
so at this point we'd like to initiate a poll so there's the question you're seeing it now and also on your poll on your panel I'll give you a minute or so to respond to that if you would Okay, let's go ahead here. So next up we have uh, Luis Bermudez, who is the thread architect uh, leading the cross-community interoperability thread, and he will present on the outcomes in that section of the testbed. So I hand it over to you on the audio, Luis. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me, Lou? Yes, we can hear you fine. It's good. Okay, very good. So uh, it was uh, first um, a pleasure to lead the cross-community interoperability thread. Uh, we cover very interesting uh, topics, uh, which are listed here. Uh, service profiles, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Conflation, provenance, semantics, volunteer geographic information, linking, like how do we link different features to other information, and ontology core model. Next. We have these sponsors. There's um, already Lou present the sponsors, but the ones that uh, the sponsors that uh, sponsor this activity were Lockheed Martin, the STL, NGA, Natural Resources Canada, Army Geospatial Center, and USGS. Next. And we have these different participants that provided the services, the clients, the reports, the architecture. Next. So um, sometimes it is important to show uh, the different solutions in a scenario. So in this case, uh, we use a Monterey. So if you are not familiar with Monterey, uh, this is on the west coast of the US. It's a very nice place to go, but it has very interesting characteristics. So uh, it's a tourist place, but also is composed of rocky canyons that has mud that have mud and sand on the floor, which they offer a great habitat for rock fishes and contains fragile corals, sponges. Uh, so you can imagine that this is a rich, very richness place that can serve, for example, as a buffet for whales, food for whales. So it's a very, very nice area. Um, next. So we have these um, marine conservation areas in a nice location, right? So that's part of the scenario. Then we can also think of, well, we have NATO vessels in the area and they are working with the Naval Postgraduate School to better integrate uh, information when we are in emergency response. When we need an emergency response. So next. And this is, for example, when imagine a cargo freighter collides with an oil tank. So you can imagine uh, this is a right a terrible accident. You have crippled on some of the vessels that can be affected. Uh, ships that are around, the habitat, which as I said before, is a sanctuary, the fish industry, uh, the folks that live in Monterey or are visiting Monterey. Next. So when we have the, these situations, um, emergency responders get notified and there is an analyst. An analyst that is trying to get all data around the region all the data that will help emergency responders make a plan to better provide a solution to the situation. So if you are uh, not very familiar to OGC Web Services, there are two main services that we're going to discuss in this thread. The first one is the OGC Web Feature Service, WFS, that provides access to vector data, right, points, uh, uh, polylines, polygons, etc., and OGC web map service that allows uh, a client 
to get access to images. Um, next. So this is what happens. The analyst nets needs this fresh imagery from, from the area and also wants to get uh, all the possible data that the, the US government can provide and also, because we have these NATO allies in the area, uh, data from you know, other sources that can provide um, more information to the situation. Next. And um, most of the times the services are provided in, in a very uh, basic way. Uh, most of other times, like for example in this case, governments or organizations provide some restrictions about how to provide the standards. So they provide a little more, more rules. For example, they say there is a maximum width and a maximum height of an image. or we should only provide certain types of formats for the image or only support certain coordinate reference systems. So that's what happens when we create profiles. And in this activity, next, we uh, tested uh, various profiles and uh, uh, make them available to a client and we wanted to experiment or to see how difficult it was for the client to be able to access those different profiles that were a little bit different from each other. So we have the DigiWeek WM, WMS uh, profile, we have the UK Mod WMS, the DigiWeek uh, NSE WMS, the DigiWeek WFS, and a very simple uh, digi digital uh, nautical chart WFS. Um, Next. So this is a movie that shows the client interacting with those services. Th this, client, this client knows how to get WFS uh, data, knows how to get WMS data, and you can see here interacting with the Envisia WMS uh, DMC with the interactive instruments, uh, web feature service, uh, NDA DD week profile. And this interacting with uh, the national map, uh, the week USGS. So as you see, it was very easy for the client to get uh, access to to all this data without uh, very little effort. Uh, next. Now, what's important about these activities is that the sponsors bring a requirement and they say, well, we have these profiles, we want to know if they can play with other profiles, see what are the issues, if a client is going to have a lot of issues interacting with them. And fortunately, the results were very positive. And uh, as part of the results, then the STL or the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory confirmed that the UK Ministry of Defense are considering the adoption of the DigiWeek WFS 2.0 profile. So uh, the sponsors tested, in this case, a profile, and then they can incorporate into their organization the technology that was tested, lowering the risk. Next. So following um, the scenario th that we had, well, we know there is an emergency situation going on uh, we are going to have an oil spill, so we need to run an oil spill model. And in order to run these models, we need to type, we need two type of data. One, wind data, and the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are in this case the short line. So let's talk about the short line next. So as it frequently happens when you are looking at that area of interest, you will see that you will have. Uh, data from different sources that can overlap. Even they can represent the same feature but are different. In this case, we had this, um, we have the digital nautical chart and the NDA topographic uh, data store, both representing the shoreline in a different way. Next. So we had this process called conflation uh, that allows to somehow uh, select, for example, a target source or be able to find 
uh, combination of those two to be able to uh, generate a better set of data to the end user. Next. So the, here is another uh, movie that shows uh, the client interacting with first, here is the two sources, and then invokes a special process, which is the CCI conflation. The user selects the different future types and wants to be conflated. We are invoking the web processing service from ASU. I will provide details about the conflation process. And remember that these WPSs allow us to put any algorithm on the web. In this case, it was a very uh, specific uh, process which is conflating two feature types. As you see, the result came back and uh, the result came in a way that allowed the client to display the source, the target, and what was conflated. Next, if we look more into the detail, if we like zoom in, um, okay, thank you. If we can zoom, we can see that uh, we have uh, the TDS, which was one of the original sources, and DNC, and then we have the black line, which is the conflated coastline, and we can see the orange transects that show uh, what were the two points that were conflated from the original uh, sources. Next. So following uh, the, the scenario, uh, let's say now we have the uh, boundary conditions, we're able to run the model, so we wanted to do inland coordination. And this is, we need to find the points of interest that can help the emergency responders. For example, fire stations. And the same as the short line, we have the case that we have fire stations from two sources, but they're different. So not all the sources like USGS and NDA have the same number of fire stations. So in this, in this case, we're going to conflate these points. Next. So and again, this is a video that shows the uh, worldview client interacting with these two sources of data. So you can see, for example, one follows the TDS schema, the other one follows the USDS schema. Uh, the attributes might be different, so it's not only the location that is different, but also the attributes. And similar as we did before, we invoke a conflation process, and this is all done via the client. So it's a very easy user interface for the user. Um, in this case, where we have different attributes, the user can uh, select and can uh, define what is the relation of one attribute from one source to the other. Next. So if we look more in detail, we will see that there is a source and a target, and you can define rule types, such as matching field, or it's a fixed value, or if a, an attribute is missing, then it is added to the, the target. But the user can define this explicitly, so the uh, mapping or conflation from uh, the source to the target is done in a complete way. Next. So let's continue with, with the movie. So the WPS, after we did the, the mapping of attributes or the rules, um, the WPS is called, and then we get back some information. Um, we get the information, of course, in XML, which is uh, rendered nicely by the client. Um, next. So if, if we see more details, what was um, 
returned by the web processing service, uh, we see first that has the information about what was conflated, right? What is the source and the target? And this is what we call provenance. Next, the provenance allows to know that kind of information, but also others, for example, the, the result. Um, when was it done? Oh, there were 19, for example, here, uh, fire stations added. And uh, for next, and for capturing the provenance information, since OGC specialize, specializes in the spatial models, so forth, we're not experts in provenance. We tried to see one of our uh, other standards development of organizations, such as the W3C, where we have very good relations with, and the leaders of the provenance ontology participated in the working group, and we were able to create a provenance ontology that, or reuse the provenance ontology and create our own uh, conceptualizations that allow us to capture the provenance of a conflation process using the uh, the elements from the provenance ontology. So you will see here, this was captured in something called RDF or Resource Description Framework. And uh, you can capture information about, um, like for example, who pushed the button and all the other information that I showed before. Uh, next. So the user also needs to provide some information about uh, who did it, right, who pushed the button, and also comments. This is also part of the provenance. For example, why was the conflation run? Uh, why? Because then if other users are going to get or reuse that WFS later, they can go to the uh, where the provenance lives and get information about those features and learn who did it, why, what was the source, what was the target, what was the WPS, when was that done? Next. So after that information is captured, we update so next. We update the WFS. And this is done via what we call a transactional web feature service, where we added, uh, for example, the new geometries, right? The new fire stations, or we added the attributes that were missing in some of the features. And the provenance uh, was updated in a SparkQL server. So this was a dedicated SparkQL server that allows to uh, save, store, query the RDF, the Resource Description Framework, provenance that had the information about uh, the features that were conflated and the WFS T. Next. So as a conclusion to, to this part, um, before when the user had different sources in a region, for example, wanted to run a model and, and had these two boundary conditions, the user had to select one. Here we had a better process that we allow to conflate, which then provides a more comprehensive a data set to the end user. We're allowed to store the history of what was done, provenance, that will allow anybody to go uh, and inspect what was done for certain futures and all the Bernese standards, not only OGC, but also uh, other organizations that we have good relation with, that, as such as the W3C. Next, and another uh, successful outcome, so sorry, next, another successful outcome uh, from this activity was that the WPS reference implementation developed by 52 North uh, said that they're going to include in the next releases the result of the how the provenance was captured. Uh, so they were very excited about it and that this is going to be part of the next uh, the next releases. So if, if you are a user of 52 North WPS server, suspect to have this solution soon coming to you. Next. So another topic uh, uh, that I want to touch is 
what we did with volunteer geographic information. So as you know, uh, VGI, or volunteer geographic information, is uh, crowdsourced data that can be, next, can be seen as another layer right, in, in a, let's say, GIS graphic information system where you have base maps, you have vector data, you have other kind of data, but it is nice to think that we can have these uh, data, which is, as I said, crowdsourced as an other layer. Next. So in this case, we're able to, if we have one point, uh, this is for example in a gassy tier, um, can we get more information about that point? from sources such as Twitter or from sources such as Flickr. Next. So to do that, um, we, we provided a WPS, Web Processing Service, and a WFS that provided these data in an easy way accessible to a client, to a, a GIS client, a client that is able to interact with the WPS or interact with the WFS. So that was integrated in, again, worldview that was the client used in the test bed. Next. So now, uh, just finishing the scenario um, <clears throat> topic, <clears throat> the analyst have an updated coastline, the model result was run, and the user has all the points of interest. This is the fire stations in the area that will allow the emergency responders to make a better uh, plan and decision. Next. So the conflation and linking was advancing gas tier services, and I have touched a little bit about that, but I will provide more information in these next slides. So if you're not aware what a gas tier is, is just a geographical dictionary. It happens that the items in that dictionary can be represented as points, for example, in the WFS Web Feature Service, and that we call a WFSG. There are a lot of gas ETRs around. One is, for example, the USGS, Geographic Names Information System, or GINIS. So next. So this is the, um, this is the architecture of what happened in the gas ETR work. So you see on the top the client, and uh, you see that we have a global gas ETR from Envisia. On the left side, we have something called an RTF triple store that has uh, <clears throat> all the semantics about how to get information from GeoNames, DBPD, and OpenStreetMap OSM, and also has some of the mappings that will allow to get uh, the relations with features in the gas ETRs with these sources. And you will see also on the bottom and right, the three gassy tiers that, that, that we use, one from NGA, the other one from USGS, and the third one on the right side was a local gassy tier from New Brunswick. Next. So let's concentrate on the first uh, component, the RDF triple store. Next. So uh, we have, uh, for example, here, uh, showing St. Jones in one of the gas tiers, and we want to see if we can get more information about that place via the GeoSparkle server that has information with this crowdsourced data. Next. Uh, so here you will see that there is a link to GeoNames. Next. And we can also uh, provide, because we have all these links to GeoNames, Wikipedia, etc. we can bring information from Wikipedia about St. John. Next. And uh, the same we can do for uh, DBpedia. Next. And um, let's say, as well, I mean, we had uh, before that we have the same problem that we have for, for an area of interest, we have different sources of data that can overlap. And we want to know if there is a relation between those features. Um, so here, it's a case that we have two gassy tiers and we have these different points, they do not overlap. One has more points 
uh, and we want to know if they are if some of those two points are the same it's just that they happen to be represented in a different location these some of that happen because uh, sometimes we represent areas as points so if we want to represent St. John, St. John is really in a polygon, but sometimes it's just represented as a point. Next. So similar as, as we did uh, before, uh, next. We use conflation. And in this case, we're going to use again the 52 north conflation that is going to conflate between these two PSC tiers. Next. So uh, we uh, invoke the conflation between these two gassy tiers using worldview client. Next. And uh, we get some results. In this case, the result was represented with a line, a line that uh, presented that two of these points were related. Um, next, and you can see more information about uh, this relation in the left side. For example, you can see so we're able to provide some score uh, about uh, that uh, that relation, and in this case it says score 100%. So we were looking at you know the distance that were apart, the attributes, the name of the future, all that information was looked and able to create a proper score. Next. And um, OpenStreetMap, if we want, we want it also to be able to link those uh, points in gassy tiers to OpenStreetMap objects. And if you look, for example, St. John in OpenStreetMap, you get that geometry. So in this case, we were also able to link the geometry from OpenStreetMap to the point in a, a gassy tier. Next. Now let me change a little bit of topics. So I'm going to talk about how we did some sophisticated searches using global gassy tiers. Uh, so you will see here that the uh, client worldview is interacting with the global gassy tier that is able then to get the request and do multiple requests to other gassy tiers. This is called cascading request. But we did a little bit more than just cascading. Next. So let's uh, uh, assume that a user wants to, send, to search for uh, any features that are summits. Next. And the user gets some results. This is, again, remember, is interacting with the global gas tier. Um, so what you will get these points that are summit. Next. But if maybe you will not realize what's happening sort of behind the scenes. And in the left side, you will see that there are futures returned that are not only summit, but also futures that have uh, mount, that are mountains, that are hills, that are ridges, and so forth, because we were able to do this semantic mapping with those concepts. Uh, so you type summit, and then you get all the other futures that are so somehow related. Uh, semantically related to summit. So next. And we perform uh, two interesting searches that are mostly not supported in a normal WFS, but very interested, very interesting in, in gassy tier services. One is a radial search that says, well, I'm here in this point. I want to know everything that's around me, you know, for example, five miles. Next. And also uh, another uh, important search was, for example, one that says find airports near summit. So uh, I want to get the airports and I want to get them ranked based on distance. So that was also implemented in the client and in the server side. Next. So here are the results. You see yellow are the airports that are nearby uh, one of the uh, triangles that represent uh, the summit. And you will see also uh, the distance. 
Uh, so it found the five nearest airports. Next. So as a conclusion for the WFSQ, we're able uh, to show that we're able to link to other sources, crowdsource data, like OpenStreetMap, DBpedia, GeoNames, show that we're able to conflate and show the relation and provide a score uh, if we have uh, data from different sources for a region that do not totally overlap. Uh, we're able to do some semantic matching that allow to do better queries, in particular when we have global gasetier searches. Uh, we're able to do sophisticated spatial constraints, like nearby and radius, and we're able to cascade these rich semantic searches via virtual gasetiers. Next, so all this work, most of this work was really provided by a lot of work behind that was focused on ontology. So let me talk a little bit about that. Next. So the ontology, uh, as you see, uh, we had a GeoSparkle server that the client interacted with, and behind we had representations of the different gasetiers, and we have on the right side uh, gasetier mappings and RDF store. So this is just a small view of what happened, not of all the activity, but on these gasetier uh, services, uh, what was happening behind the GeoSparkle server. Next. And all these semantic components and the ontologies that were created were based on an ontology core model. So you see that's the link and you later you can get the slides and go and visit in more detail the different components of this ontology. So you will see that we had one uh, component based on spatial, temporal, event, measure, math, utilities, and a common that were able to link with upper ontologies and, and so forth. Next. And um, and this, uh, finally, this uh, ontology also helped to test, create a unified instant model where we're able to map different instant models to and from this core model. So remembering previous test beds, uh, those of you that were familiar, we had like this Rosetta Storm model that we map to and map from in order to provide a single place, a core model that we can easily integrate with other sources. Uh, next, I think that's all, Lou. Yep, thanks, Luis. I appreciate that. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about um, shifting gears a bit. Um, I'd like to discuss the work that was accomplished uh, to improve the capabilities and interoperability to share water resource information across borders. And in the case uh, here studied uh, in this instance involved the U.S. and Canadian resources. Um, the problem as stated is, uh, is uh, where different hy hydro hydrologic uh, data is stored and exchanged in different hydrologic models and schema. That's one of the parts of the problem. Um, another is the information requested is available in different formats conforming to each of the different models, different schema formats, different schema. And the water information from different models um, may have been uh, um, uh, have different names and have different meanings. So in this part, uh, really the goal of this part of the thread was to provide uh, a means to request cross-border water information using the terms that a user understands in his own national hydrologic model such as NHD in the US um, uh, or U NHN in, in Canada to include data that originates in both the US and Canada that adheres to the different hydrologic models. So the question is uh, how can this be done? So what we did uh, to achieve this uh, cross-border interoper interoperability of the hydro models and to associate the data, the project used a common hydrologic feature model known as HY features. Uh, this meta model for hydrologic features was used to provide the mappings uh, between the models for NHD in the US and NHN in Canada. Now, the diagram uh, shows on the left shows the HY feature model as it exists uh, within the OGC's general feature model. And we use that to create uh, model-based, um, well-established and accepted relationships and terminology for the water resources. The diagram, part of the diagram on the right, represents uh, the results of efforts to map the features from HY features model to the NH, 
D in this case uh, for a selected set of uh, uh, feature types, in this case the flow line, uh, and the mappings for NHD and the corresponding examples for NHN were prepared and stored in semantic query and uh, stored for semantic query and retrieval to mediate the model differences between the, each of the models. So the, the mappings described in the previous slide were then implemented in a solution architecture as shown in this diagram. The national hydro data sets of the US and Canada were provided by the hydro data services components shown on the right. The hydrologic data was accessible via SQL interface to a database and also as a, via a web feature service. Uh, the hydro model, modeling clients uh, shown on the left were developed to test and demonstrate the capabilities of the solution architecture. These clients were used to initiate a request to the hydro model service implemented as an OGC web processing service or WPS. The model service issues the request to the hydro mediation service which uses the stored model to model mapping information to translate the terms of the query into a form understood by the source database, for example NHD or NHN. And the results of the query were returned and transformed through a mediation of model services into the hydro model schema format requested by the originating user client. So the achievements in this, uh, in this part of the project uh, really w was intended to, and I believe we were able to accomplish at least uh, to start, a demonstration of how the HY feature model could be used as a bridge uh, between different, uh, different hydrologic data models. Um, out of this uh, work also developed a semantic mapping concept between NHD, NHN, and the uh, HY features model. Uh, we implemented a Sparkle endpoint uh, for querying the data model uh, mapping information and implemented a mediation service uh, using a standard WPS as a means to, um, to access, uh, access that uh, that mapping and mediation information. So challenges uh, for the future, really the, to develop a formal standard mapping framework using RDF to enhance the interoperability of mapping concepts. In this particular project, we only took just a, a select um, single feature in order to demonstrate the capabilities and the concepts on how you would accomplish this, but to really uh, ensure a, a, a greater degree of interoperability and usefulness, it, you should really do that for the entire uh, model uh, model itself. Um, identify common pr patterns and uh, exemplar mappings to support development of tools uh, for a sustainably reusable process. Some of those patterns and concepts were developed in this architecture. Uh, perhaps there's additional work to be done to improve that, uh, that architecture, uh, but at least it's a start. And a full national hydro model mapping solution would be much more complex uh, than the use of one feature, obviously, as done in this instance. So there's, there's a good deal of work to be done in order to, um, to go from, from a single feature uh, sample demonstration to, uh, to really building out a capability with a full national hydro model mapping solution uh, capability. So, and with that, uh, we go to our next poll, which is displayed here on the screen, and we invite you to respond to that if you would, please. Give you a moment to respond. about there and get ready to move on and close that poll out. Okay, so next up, uh, Raj Singh at OGC uh, will lead a discussion about the uh, results from the open mobility part of the test bed. So Raj. Hello 
Hello, everybody. <clears throat> so my name is Raj Singh, and I'm going to discuss the open mobility thread of Testbed 10. So the four topics we, we covered are cloud computing, uh, looking at some of the looking at using OGC services in a cloud environment and exploring different different architectures that uh, can be can be used with uh, OGC services. Mobile data. I'm going to talk about ex, uh, Testbed 10's work on geo packaging. Now, in Testbed 9, we we did a lot of the work of developing the geo package file format that was finalized earlier this year through a standards working group. And, and in Testbed 10, we build on that work to talk about how geo packages can be automatically created and how that creation process can fit into a uh, the OGC services environment. The third, third topic is OWS Context. OWS Context is another new encoding format from OGC that allows you to capture a lot of uh, contextual awareness information or situational awareness. So basically Context lets you capture everything that goes into a map, all the services that participate, contribute to uh, the data that you're looking at, whether they're WMS or WFS or WCS, and uh, <clears throat> potentially styling rules, uh, small snippets of actual data in KML or GML format, and even non-spatial data sources like, K like uh, PDFs. Now, in OWS context, I mean in, oh, in Testbed 10, we did a few different things with OWS context. We looked at uh, storing that in a mean U.S. National Information Exchange model, and we looked at translating from the existing XML format into a JSON encoding of that format, and also looking at uh, doing map annotations with that. And finally, the fourth topic is integrated client enhancement. And I'm not going to discuss a, a, that a lot on this webinar, but the point of this study was to look at how you can better relate OGC services to one another. So that, let's say you're looking at a web, looking at some data through a web mapping service interface. Web mapping service is just giving you really pictures of the underlying data. It's giving you a nice combined map. It's easy to get at and easy to use because it's just an image. But unfortunately, that simplicity comes with some cost. You don't know where, where, let's say you're looking at roads, you don't know where the uh, underlying vector data store for those roads came from. So this study provides some initial, uh, initial solutions for integrating those services and being able to link from, say, that WMS that has some roads data in the picture to the actual web feature service that that, that was providing those roads. And uh, <clears throat> it looks at the whole OGC services architecture. So you could take that example and extend it to finding the web coverage service that powers a web mapping service view or powers a web map tiling service view. So that's a very interesting engineering report, which um, will not be discussed too much further here, but you can find it on the public engineering reports site at OGC. So first, I'm going to move into, well, first, let's, uh, let's acknowledge our sponsors. So the organizations that sponsored this thread are the European Space Agency, National, U.S. National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and the U.K. Defense Science and Technology Lab. Thank you all. And uh, also our participants in this thread come from uh, all over Europe and America, North America, I mean, including Canada. <clears throat> and you see I'm not going to take the time to uh, name all of them. <clears throat> okay, so let's move on to our first uh, subthread of activity, mobile data. So as I just mentioned, we want to build on the uh, geo packaging file format, which just became a standard. We're going to look at how the creation of geo packages can be can be automated. So a quick primer on geo package. Basically, it's a it's a SQLite based format for storing spatial data. 
SQLite is a <clears throat> it's a file. SQLite data data is stored in files, but you have a SQL based interface to um, to work with and manipulate that data. SQLite is implemented as a library. It comes on every platform that you can get. So any mobile phone, tablet, <clears throat> desktop operating system, Mac, Windows, Android, it's available on all of them when you get your when you buy your device install your operating system. So <clears throat> it was really important for us to sort of move the geospatial world towards the more mainstream IT world. And that's why we chose SQLite as the new, as the, as the foundation for this new universal uh, geospatial data format. Now you can store vector data as well as tiled imagery inside a geo package. <clears throat> And some future work on GeoPackage will be to store actual coverage, multi-dimensional coverages in there. So <clears throat> it's great to have a file format, but in order to really uh, play nice with the with the services ecosystem, it's even better to be able to computationally uh, automate the creation of those files. So we had a few different scenarios we looked at for this. The first is the most basic, um, moving geodata from the warehouse to a mobile device. And I call it a warehouse because it really could be anything. It could be a spatial database. It could be just a bunch of shape files on your hard drive. <clears throat> it could be that warehouse could be any sort of data source. And you want to get those, you want to get that data source to a mobile device. You probably want to get it to multiple devices and you want to make sure everybody has the same thing. And this is a scenario in uh, the military, in consumer apps like augmented reality, and you can imagine this being very useful for a Census Bureau takers, uh, Census Bureau door-to-door -door census takers who get a section every day. They might get a section of uh, the country to go out and walk and, and survey people. And that could easily be provided through a geo package. Second scenario is synchronizing the changing data between mobile devices. So you go, uh, you're out in the field. The Census Bureau example applies here. You're creating updates. You're getting new information. You're improving what you came out came out there with. And let's say you meet, <clears throat> let's say you meet another person who has that same data set or another device that has that same data set, and they've also been making changes and creating better information. It would be nice if you could just synchronize what you've been doing and so that you don't have to go back to back quote unquote home to get the latest information. You can sync with whatever new device uh, you meet out there in the field. So very important scenario from the point of view of just you know being able to have the freshest information uh, in peer-to-peer -peer networks. It's it, that importance becomes even magnified <clears throat> when you talk about a scenario where all the devices might not make it back home in a military engagement. You might lose devices; they might, you know, get damaged. People might not make it back. So, being able to always keep that data synchronized wherever devices happen to meet creates a very resilient information store, an information model. And uh, you know, just in general, peer-to-peer -peer apps, synchronizing between peers is important because you don't want to put too much of a load on the server. Uh, Consumer-facing peer-to-peer apps could have millions of users, and you don't want to always have synchronization going through one, one uh, point of failure. Final scenario is probably the you know the most basic, building on the first. If you go out and make field changes, when you get back to the data warehouse, you want to synchronize that those back in. And that's uh, also a great place to do QA, QC. <clears throat> so uh, here in the screenshots, you see some of the examples of the way participants use this. Augmented Technologies Willa mobile app uses, uh, can get its data not only from web feature services, but also from geo packages now to give you a more up-to-date and uh, information-rich view in your augmented reality environment. 
the Luciad was another participant, screenshot on the right, which uh, which prototyped the ability to take field notes with pictures and uh, and text and save those into a geo package. So what you're seeing in this image is imagery, a base map coming from a geo package, as well as two little polygons, which are the spread of a plume over two days. Those are vector data in the geo package. And then you see a picture of a harp seal. I think it's a harp seal. And a little note on that picture. And that annotation is also saved in a separate geo package data set. Next. So, <clears throat> as you can see from that, there are a lot of uh, really powerful, important use cases driving driving this work. So what we did in the end was we implemented the creation of a geo package with a web processing service. Now we initially looked at the creation of a geo package as a special case of uh, synchronizing information between devices. That turned out to be too heavyweight a solution or too sophisticated a solution for just uh, being able to create geo package. It turns out that synchronization requires a lot more smarts between clients and servers than you get um, from simple geo packaging exercise. <clears throat> so at least for now we recommend that uh, geo packaging is done through a web processing service interface. And all we really did here beyond the generic web processing service interface is define a process called basically create geo package which gets initialized with a OWS context document. So like I said a few minutes ago, context document really describes all the data underlying a map you're looking at. All the services powering it, whether it's web map service, web feature service, web tile service, um, and the extent that you're looking at, <clears throat> the extent of the world that you're looking at. So all that is described in this context document. And basically, the device that wants a geo package starts with a context document, says, hey, it would be great if all this data, instead of being accessed through services, were available locally in a geo package so I can go offline and use it. Sends that context document to a geo packaging WPS with the command execute. The geo packaging WPS <clears throat> goes off or reads that, parses that context document, finds all the services, decides whether it can read it. In this project, we implemented the support for web feature service and web map tile service. So it finds all the services in the context document it can, it can work with, <clears throat> which basically means translate to geo package. Goes out, grabs all the data from those services it needs, translates it into geo package format, puts it into a single geo package, and then takes that context, original context document, sticks it in the geo package also, but instead of the context document only having links to those internet-based services, it now also has a link, an alternative link, <clears throat> to get that data from the local geo package. And now we have a single file, which is sent back to the client, and they can go take that data and go use it however they want, and not and be disconnected, be offline, and uh, highly more highly performant probably, and also uh, more battery efficient, more power efficient, which is important for mobile devices. So you can turn off the internet even if it's available. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, geosynchronization is a bit tougher than simply um, a data a single data creation exercise. So we had we did a lot of research on the first few weeks and months of this project on how this should work with geodata. And <clears throat> we came up with uh, we came up with a solution which I think is very important. Um, for those of you who have been following geosynchronization efforts within OGC for a while, you might ask, haven't we been doing this already? 
There's a draft standard geosynchronization service out there. It has a public engineering report. It works very well. It's been implemented a number of times. The only problem with it <clears throat> is that it's web feature service centric. It requires you to understand web feature service transactional language to, to understand what updates need to be made in your synchronization. Now that is, that's great for people who are already implementing what WFS services heavily, but we also wanted to look, after all, test beds are about experimentation, we wanted to also look at having a, uh, an approach that was more service and data for ag agnostic. So since our primary goal here was to look at the synchronization of geo packages, we kind of wanted to drop that requirement for being able to understand WFS language, which would allow you to do geo package to geo package, sync WFS to geo package, GeoJSON to geo package, basically any geospatial data to any geospatial data synchronization. Another driving uh, a driving requirement for this was to be to be more to be more lightweight and uh, <clears throat> ability to recover from errors and not so tied down to a to a very command and control environment. So we went with an approach where changes would be eventually consistent, which is a database term for an approach to synchronization where you never know if you really have all the changes that were made, you know, when you first came or when you when you asked for uh, the updates, but eventually every every participant in the synchronization um, in the synchronization of a particular data set will will get the changes eventually. It's important. So what that does for you, or well, what you lose from that, is you don't know if you really got all the changes up to the second from when you requested them. But you do get much better performance. You can, you know, always check in, check in on a data set, see if it's changed, see if it's changed, and uh, it's a much more flexible, resilient architecture. Next. So here is the basic uh, <clears throat> solution we designed. The easy way to describe this is the only difference from asking for data is that, well, there's really no difference for, for the request for asking for data. The only difference in geosynchronization is that in addition to getting back the data, you'll also get an ID for the data set and a revision number. Having a unique data set ID is very important when you want to get rid of the idea that data sets are only in one server. If you want to be able to call roads in some in one server the same as roads in another, roads in a shape file on one person's server to be the same data set as roads provided through a WFS on a government server, you have to have a unique ID. There was no way around that. And then, to do good synchronization, you also need a revision number on that data set or so that, you know, whenever a change is made, it gets a new revision number. It's the only way to be able to track what's happened to the information. So basically, with that information, everything can work. Um, that's a heavy requirement on software because tracking revisions is something which you know, it's not just a service level change. It's really, it's really, a, you have to think about managing your information in a different way if you're going to be able to provide a revision number on a data set. So this is why we didn't implement um, geo packaging as a special case of geosync, because really, if you want to do geosync, you have to have, you have to have a real, you know, a revision aware approach to managing your whole data database. But once you do that, it's very easy. You have a get data operation where you check out the latest revision. You get that globally unique ID for the data set and the revision ID or the revision number. And then you take that data out, go happily along. And then whoever you meet along the way, you can always ask them, hey, do you have this data set also? Oh, you do? Hey, have you changed it? Do you have a higher revision number than me? 
Oh, you do? Okay. Uh, let me get let me get your changes. And then we get to the get changes operation. And you're basically comparing two revision numbers between between peers and seeing who is the latest. You might also you might both have different revisions. And then you negotiate that changes uh, process. You get the changes from <clears throat> you get the changes from the person from the other person if they have a higher revision number, or you get the changes from or they get the changes from you, or potentially there's a mix there. And as a uh, as I said before, the uh, previous geosynchronization work we've done is very WFS centric. We're using WFS transactional language. Um, in this case, we decided to we wanted to use something which is more generic for across all geospatial information. So, for the changes, we went with uh, GeoJSON, uh, lingua franca across geodata and web formats. So, GeoJSON is I won't get into what it is completely, but as far as its spatial information model goes, it gives you anything as complex as simple features. So, as you see, simple features. And uh, <clears throat> which covers probably 95% of the types of information that people come across. There are some more complex ways of describing space which uh, wouldn't be covered, but those are very specialized use cases. Next. So that uh, wraps up our geo packaging experiments. I'm going to move on to the OWS context work we did and focus mainly on annotation. We also did, we had one participant in Visha do a study of how to, how ODS context can work within uh, the US NEAM, National Information Exchange Model uh, environment, and, and you can read about that in that engineering report. And we also had a, as I mentioned earlier, I think, a uh, report by Teragu on translating various contexts from XML, which is the only format currently uh, approved and published, to JSON. So we're working towards having a JSON encoding of Odivis context. And Tara Dewey did a lot of good work on describing how that could uh, happen. And their engineering report on that topic not only describes uh, how to map context to XML to JSON, but is really a more generic rules for obtaining JSON documents directly from existing XML documents. And it identifies a lot of issues in, in general about going to JSON and the different ways JSON can be encoded and look uh, as you translate from XML. There are a few different options for how uh, that's represented in JSON. Well, that's a good report to uh, look at if that's in, of interest to you. And finally, the third OWS context experiment was about annotation. Annotation is a topic which, you know, you wonder why it's there is no uh, existing standard yet, because it's really one of the core use cases for mapping that's existed for thousands and thousands of years. Ever since we made a map, ever since the first person made a map, I think the, the next thing they did was to put an X on it to show that's where that's where we need to go or that's where we need to attack or something like that. So we are uh, <coughs> still working on approaching a, a universal standard for describe, for putting annotations on a map. Now in this experiment we built upon some work that's over 10 years old now. One of OTC's first test beds actually uh, took on this challenge. And I think the problem with it was that it was yeah, that it was too too tied to uh, particular data formats, and so we really tried to really tried to loosen up some of those requirements and create a solution an approach that really would allow software developers not to have too much to change if they implemented this. So the important things about this are that we have a conceptual approach to annotation, which which uh, consists of three primary objects. You have the place on the place on the map you want to annotate, and that's a real world location. You have 
the annotation itself, what you want to say about that place. It could be text or pictures or both. And then you have this thing that connects what you want to say about the place, what you want, what, what your annotation is, to the place itself. And often, as you see in this picture, that's just a, it's an arrow. But there's the possibility of doing other things than just an arrow, but usually that's an arrow. So we have, and all those things are optional, except for the place on Earth you're talking about. You always need that place. Sometimes you want to just draw an X, not say anything more about it, assume that's enough. So that's why everything else becomes optional. But sometimes you want to put a little note about it. Um, and that's why you need the other pieces. So <clears throat> I'm not going to get too much into detail in this. There, please read the engineering report. But we looked at describing those three basic objects in in a language in a sort of language native to the OWS context document. We also looked at describing that in in uh, KML and then dynamically converting that, those two approaches to HTML using XSLT transformations. Now this works really well with context because you always want a base map under there. You want lots of information layers of which annotation is usually the top. And I think this is a powerful work moving towards the standard. The thing that's always held it back <coughs> before, I think, is if we got too specific about how do you do this styling of the annotation, how you do the colors, the line widths, the text fonts, and all those things. And I think we've tried to be very smart about not going too far down that path of being descriptive or being proscriptive and keeping the software from preventing software from being creative and doing its best job and differentiating itself based on how it does the styling. So we've described the major elements and leave the styling up to up to you as a software developer. Next. So our final area of uh, experimentation was cloud. Cloud's a hot topic nowadays. I'll go on to the next slide. <clears throat> so everybody's looking at moving a lot of their services and architectures to the cloud. So we wanted to begin the uh, begin the process of looking at how OTC services and architectures work in that environment. So we uh, <coughs> we started with some very simple experiments and worked into create increasingly complex uh, approaches. The simple experiment we did was just put services on the cloud, look at scalability and performance. So what's happening? Clearly, a lot of people move to the cloud because you get cost benefits. You don't have to manage your own infrastructure when you have heavy loads, like in a emergency response disaster situation, which a lot of geospatial people are interested in. You might have amazing intense load for a month, and then certain services might not be used for years afterwards or before. So the cloud is a perfect environment for that. Um, so we wanted to see how OGC services did. Another important aspect for the geospatial industry is processing on the cloud. We have huge data sets, but our, but our computational processes are usually very small code. You know, if you write a, <coughs> any software program, even a one gigabyte software program even, that's much smaller than the data sets often used, which could be you know, multiple terabytes. So being able to move processing to data is a place we want to get to in OGC. And the interoperability angle here is highly important because often you want to move processing to data which is housed by a different organization, potentially a different software environment, potentially a different cloud provider itself. So looking at all these different hybrid scenarios were, were of interest to us in this and the future test beds. Uh, so please, next slide. So we have come out with a performance and scalability engineering report, which does some of that basic, gets some of that basic information out about the ability of OGC, OGC services to perform well in the cloud, 
we're lucky to have Amazon Web Services um, participate in the test bed and help us out with some of this work. And you'll see in that report uh, reports on uh, or statistics on web mapping services and web map timing services and how they <laughs> how performance works on in Amazon's case S3 versus uh, versus a simple uh, sorry EC2 server which is basically their name for just a regular virtual server basically another looks like a computer out there in the cloud versus S3 which is basically a file storage system which can be used to mock up a WMTS so you'll see some discussion of that in there you also see a section of that report done by 52 North which talks about a hybrid, hybrid cloud setup um, benchmarks against quality of service requirements of the European Inspire project and there's some interesting processing scalability results in there you'll see the graph at the bottom of this bottom left of this page talking about the average time of the WPS to respond I'm sorry that bottom left graph was uh, GMU and other participants work on on benchmarking computational services the uh, <coughs> the work done by 52 North about quality of service requirements of its fire is also in the report that's just not the graph so that's the performance and scalability uh, engineering report we worked on the final cloud area next slide as I mentioned moving processing to data I think is the you know the big thing we want to get to as far as interoperability goes very hard problem to approach and uh, we had some great European experiment in this project and clearly there's some great solutions out there but still more work to be done to really have a generic and interoperable cloud processing now next slide so let me briefly describe this uh, one of the experiments this group of participants did so here we have what you're seeing on this screen is a <coughs> hybrid very complicated hybrid cloud processing scenario where if you look at the bottom of the graphic where it says Teradu 2.0 you have an orange box with some white squares in there so what you're representing there is a cloud marketplace this is a place where you can you know, use a CSW server to search for data sets search for computational processes you want to use and which are <coughs> which are actually web processing services and so once you do that you can you know purchase or acquire things in the marketplace and then decide to run services actually execute the uh, what you want to have done so in this case Teradui and Geomatis and Mapshop and Sines uh, S worked on a project for running an SPAS process the SPAS stands for or SPAS interferometry SPAS stands for small baseline subset and basically what the process we're talking about does is find areas which may be prone to earthquakes so what happens here is that you identify your data you identify the, the SPAS process that you want to run and then you deploy this uh, process to uh, to either that cloud or another cloud in this example if you follow the gray arrow on the left that SPAS process gets deployed on an Amazon cloud in, in Dublin in the UK but actually uh, we have data on another cloud over there on the right so once the process gets deployed in a cluster over here in this case I think the data is coming into uh, into or over to the cloud of the processor and it's running its processes and returning information back to the client without ever going back to the first cloud you could also move the process to the data in certain scenarios where that's important and still get back the uh, result to your client 
Now I'm going to wrap up with another a final cloud scenario where we look at a land cover image processing application. So this is showing you a bunch of different steps. The purpose is to ortho-rectify imagery and do some quality assessment of its ability to do land cover classification. So here we're picking an area of interest out of a satellite, raw satellite imagery that's not rectified yet. So this is the area we want to work with. It goes off to a web processing service to get ortho-rectify, and you saw it turn, so it works to the ground. And then that imagery is downloaded. Now that's great in and of itself to have an automated ortho-rectification process. But let's look at this, uh, <clears throat> how well that ortho-rectification was done. And this is another web processing service which goes in, looks at the, uh, the quality of that ortho-rectification, shows you the errors where it might not be so accurate. Okay, so let's say we did a great job ortho-rectifying that imagery. Now let's move on to the land cover classification step. Here you see a nice graphical interface for training, training the uh, process. Often with land cover classification, you want a human to say which areas are trees, which areas are water, which areas are field. And you just pick a few of those, and then the, the computer can do the hard work of uh, finding those all over the place. And there you see it go off and do that, and you have a nice, a nice uh, full process from end to end of being able to do orthorectification and land cover classification all through web processing services in the cloud. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Raj. I appreciate that. Uh, very good. Uh, next, we're going to move on to one more poll we have here. And if you would take a few moments to respond to the question here regarding the topics uh, just presented in open mobility. Okay, let's move on. Thank you for your responses. So, um, we thank you all for your attention today, uh, your attendance, and your interest, um, and for for your uh, colleagues and for you uh, after the fact. Um, if you want to review uh, what you heard today, there will, a recording will be available for this webinar. Um, we'll send that out as a link uh, in the follow-up email that, that will be uh, sent out. Um, shortly. Um, additional details um, about the testbed, uh, including links to the engineering reports and uh, information about the services and clients uh, deployed uh, in this testbed will be available on the uh, uh, OGC Testbed 10 website, and the URL for that uh, website is shown here. Not everything is there at this moment in time. Uh, we still have engineering reports that are being processed through for uh, review and publishing as a public engineering report, so they they may be listed uh, eventually. Um, we'll be we'll have links to show uh, how to how to actually download them as uh, as public uh, documents. So perhaps you may be interested in what you've heard today. Um, maybe you want to get involved in uh, our next testbed, which is uh, forming now in terms of. Um, identifying um, tasks, uh, concepts to be worked on, requirements uh, to be addressed uh, based on uh, sponsor inputs. Um, so we've had, um, this shows a nominal schedule, what we're looking at for, uh, for the testbed 11. Uh, we've had um, some work going on since the beginning of the year, but we're at this point now in May. We've had a public call for sponsors go out as a, as a press release. Uh, 
uh, tomorrow, the 29th, there will be a sponsor planning meeting, another one in this series. We've had one before. Um, so we'll have uh, some additional conversations to collect additional requirements, uh, ideas, concepts to potentially be included in the test in this next test bed. Uh, late June, early July, probably finish up with a um, another sponsor planning meeting to um, um, finalize some thoughts about uh, the set of requirements and how they be organized into threads. Uh, in July, then uh, finalize the requirements with uh, with the sponsors uh, uh, and their contributions and their sponsorship. September, um, between July and September, uh, work out the details with each of the sponsors for their for their sponsorship agreements. October, prepare a uh, and release a an RFQ request for quotation call for participation which would identify the, the various aspects and requirements of the test bed that's been included uh, for your consideration. Um, if you wish to submit a proposal against uh, certain requirements, that's where you go to look. Uh, the responses to, uh, to, to that RFQ in the form of proposals would be due in November. No date exactly has been set yet, but that's the general time frame. And then following the, um, the review of those proposals received, uh, evaluation, make recommendations to the sponsors and make the appropriate selections. Uh, then we would have uh, form the team that will be the participants in the next test bed and have a, a kickoff uh, workshop to be conducted um, in January timeframe of 2015. And so once the kickoff begins, uh, the whole process of uh, implementation uh, we would then conclude in June, roughly in June 2015, with a demonstration and final deliverables being due, and perhaps uh, aligning that with the next TC meeting in the time in that general time frame. So, what would you be interested in if you are uh, being either a sponsor or a participant? Um, as a sponsor. Um, they drive the requirements. They define the technical scope. Um, they set the agenda um, and also the demonstration, uh, the manner in which it's demonstrated. Uh, their inputs and recommendations, uh, requests are all taken into account along with the requirements uh, in order to compose the, um, the entire test bed in the context of the initiative. Uh, in addition to the requirements and, and uh, concepts and capabilities that they wish to have addressed, they also contribute financial resources to support the initiative and we certainly are greatly appreciative of that. Uh, participants contribute uh, to the definition of the interfaces. You're actually the ones that develop the software, uh, analyze the, uh, uh, the material, uh, develop the engineering reports and produce the prototypical implementations and other engineering support that goes to produce the kind of results that you've seen today. Uh, in this webinar. Um, in addition, uh, participants, uh, many of which receive a uh, participate as a, as a, in a cost share uh, manner in the test bed where they get a reimbursement for, for some portion of their, their work and their contributions uh, while uh, other parts are provided as uh, in kind. Um, you saw the uh, return on investment uh, figures that I mentioned earlier in, in, the test, in this webinar about the test bed cost share model. So we get um, um, a, a good return on investment of, of the hard work that's done by the participants uh, in addition to, to their in-kind support. So it's much appreciated in that respect. And of course, in this whole process, the OGC uh, staff manages the entire process uh, based upon and in accordance with our policies and procedures uh, to, prove, to produce um, uh, proven results over time. We have one more poll here. You know, take a moment to respond to this, if you would, please. If you may be interested in hearing more about the test bed 11, um, indicate if you're a prospective uh, sponsor or prospective participant, or maybe not sure yet. Um, okay, I think we got a good. Once there, quickly answered. Thank you very much. 
so now we're at the point at the end. Um, if you have any questions, let's see if we have any. Um, we do. We have. Okay. Do, you, do you want me to ask the question, or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, go ahead and read it off. Please. Sure. Uh, this one came from Karen Thomas, and this is to Louise specifically, I believe, um, because it was during the CCI uh, conflation. It says, you are showing conflation tool in operation. However, who is defining the business rules in, uh, to direct the conflation? Does this conflation tool learn from the business rules so that the conflation process becomes more automated, refined? Uh, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Karen, for providing that question. I think it's very good. So we use different uh, conflation tools behind the web processing services. These were Fuzzy Wuzzy and Roadmatcher, and they require some configuration. Um, so that's that's one part of the conflation about the points and lines, and the other were the attribute conflation, which the user did when the conflation process was run. So this was run at the time when the user uh, selected the different source and targets. Uh, so it's a little bit manual at the moment. Uh, we have done it also in the past where we have an ontology where we can provide more information about what are the relation between the attributes. Um, but it still it requires uh, to explicitly provide the semantics of those attributes in a knowledge base. And, and, there, and the tools, as I said, they require some configuration uh, so uh, you have a better process at the end. But we are not also using like a learning um, algorithm to improve the conflation. It was a proof of concept that we can conflate features, that we can then provide provenance, and we can do a WFST, which was uh, updating the source. Uh, updating one of the sources of, of completion. Uh, okay, great. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, second, question, second yeah. question uh, came from Craig Lee. In all of these presentations, security was not in the discussion, i.e. identity, authentication, authorization. Uh, were these specifically not on the table? Uh, are these considered to be non-problems for right now? or are they perceived as important, but not just being addressed at this point? Um, and that can I go to... I can take that one, yeah, probably. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Craig, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, it was basically, you know, in informing the requirements for this test bed, um, the um, security was not, was not part of a thread this particular time. I know in the past, uh, in OWS 9, test bed 9, and also in some in prior ones, uh, certainly in 8, and I know in 6, I was involved whether security was uh, was an aspect of the test bed. So short answer is was not included in this time because there wasn't, uh, they weren't on the table. Uh, there was, you have to get sponsorship to, to really make these things happen. Um, however, um, looking ahead, uh, in, as we're collecting the requirements uh, and forming the, the concepts for, for uh, test bed 11, uh, security is, is in fact uh, one of the one of the prospective requirements for uh, for testbed 11, not only just security in that sense, but also security in the cloud. So, I think that uh, those aspects you can look forward to, uh, most likely being in testbed 11. So, uh, we can't do each of these uh, uh, sets of requirements, uh, such as security, each and every time, perhaps because uh, it depends a lot on um, what kind of sponsorship we get for various requirements, as I've mentioned earlier. So I think uh, you can probably look forward to having some of that in the in the coming test bed. Are there any other questions? I don't see any that are showing up, but please enter them now if you have a question. Well, if not, we certainly thank your attention. Thank you for your attention, for, for attending, uh, and your interest in uh, this uh, webinar to find out the results of uh, Testbed 10. And perhaps we look forward to seeing you and uh, being involved in the next Testbed 11 as we go forward. So thanks very much. <laughs>